haven't already met, my name is Felicity Winkley and in April this year I was awarded my PhD from the Institute of Archaeology at UCL. My research investigated metal detectorists' attitudes to landscape and this afternoon I'm going to be using some of the data I collected to think about metal detecting and rurality, how access to land and the archaeology within is mediated and controlled and hopefully to make some suggestions about the incorporation of detectorists into heritage practice going forward. Increasingly, the situation of detectorists in England and Wales is an improving picture, but there's still plenty, I think, that can be done and plenty of room to continue to challenge deeply set notions about stewardship of and access to our shared past. So since its origins as a popular hobby around 1969, when affordable machines first became available for the general public, Metal detecting has had its detractors amongst archaeology and heritage professionals, and not without reason, uh, the community had grave concerns about the potential threat to the archaeological record and the resultant loss of information posed by hordes of people taken to the countryside, searching for and digging up metallic portable antiquities. Labelled Britain's fastest growing hobby, an increase of 100% a year since 1974 meant that by 1980, metal detecting licences, like the one on the left, issued under the Wireless Telegraphy Act of 1949, numbered almost 130,000. One significant reaction to this was the 1980 Stop Campaign, or Stop Taking Our Past, a movement comprising 32 professional member organisations, the core seven of whom included the CBA and the Museums Association. The message in the campaign leaflet was stark in its validation of archaeologists' stewardship of the nation's shared past. By contrast, the activities of metal detectorists, described as thoughtless, unscrupulous pirates, were at total odds with the archaeological method, so that digging irregular holes to grub out individual objects of metal may be compared to tearing illuminated capitals out of unique manuscripts. It's clear what the STOP campaign was trying to achieve, and yet today the language seems extreme, and we could be a bit more objective, I hope, about the problems inherent in this assumption, as Thomas suggests, not only that archaeologists have an obvious right and authority to interpret heritage, albeit of and for the perceived benefit of the public, but also that the public opinion of the time would automatically agree with this, rather than take the metal detectorist perspective, something that was to hugely hinder the impact of the movement. As Holtorf questions in his discussion of alternative archaeologies, what exactly is a distortion of archaeological interpretation or bogus archaeology as opposed to one based on the proper study of archaeological remains? On what authority is anybody entitled to divide up their fellow citizens into categories such as charlatans and misdirected hobbyists? Unfortunately, despite a huge reduction in the number of active detectorists, with current estimates placing them at around 10 to 15,000 in England and Wales, the legacy of the anti-detecting stance demonstrated by most archaeologists and museum professionals during the 70s and 80s is still felt in some circles today. Although the work of the Portable Antiquity Scheme has gone a long way to bridge the gap, most detectorists remain wary of approaching heritage professionals, especially outside of PAS, for fear of rebuttal or recrimination, whilst from the other side we are failing to capitalise on the resource that this population represents. Although it's perhaps less overtly expressed than during the days of the STOP campaign, there remains a residing issue, if not of institutionalised professional elitism, then at least an underlying failure to engage with the amateur or hobbyist community. And I use air quotes very deliberately, as for me, one evidence of this failure is the language used to describe these populations, particularly in contrast to the language we use when talking about professional archaeological activities. Whilst on the one hand, treasure hunter is seen by many to be only a hair's breadth away from looter and the negative connotations that entails, archaeological activity is described in a way to prioritise the public service angle, namely protecting, recovering, saving. And yet, as Hart and Chilton suggest, by creating a professional elitism under the auspices of having the authority and expertise to define what matters to people about the past, Archaeologists have neglected to examine the meanings of non-professional artefact recovery activities because they are perceived as <coughs> antithetical to expert heritage values. And that's where my research comes in. At its foundation, my PhD asked the theoretical question, how do we generate attachment to landscape? And by, assist, by association, how do we articulate this? Accepting metal detecting as a very unique method of interacting with the historic landscape, it sought to establish 
How do metal detectors experience landscape? What proportion feel attached to the land on which they detect regularly? And to what extent does this attachment or lack of it impact upon their attitudes towards the archaeology of that place? By asking these questions, the aim was to investigate the relationship between detectorist attitudes and the construction of sense of place and the role played by archaeological objects as mediators in that paradigm. To achieve the aims, I conducted two main strands of investigation, some of which I'm going to present in brief this afternoon. The first was a questionnaire survey, which was hosted online, and the second was a number of lengthy, unstructured interviews taking place in the field. The questionnaire, which was online from 29th of July 2011 until the end of October of the same year, received 505 responses with 85 metal detecting clubs represented, which at the time I worked out was a response rate of 34% from the known clubs operating. 92% were male and 75% were club members. The largest grouping of respondents at 33% fell under the 45 to 54 year old bracket. In response to asking if they recorded with the Portable Antiquities Scheme, whether club members or independent detectorists, 87% of the sample responded in the affirmative, which was an extremely positive result for the scheme. Of those who were not club members, only one in four didn't record with the PAS, meaning that 75% of them must have initiated contact with the FLO of their own accord in order to record their objects. The median value for the length of time that respondents had metal detected was 10 years, whilst on a histogram plot, peaks that occurred between 0 to 5 years and another again at 30 to 35 years detecting. When asked how often, on average, they go metal detecting, the largest proportion, at 29%, reported detecting once a week, whilst 25% detected more than once a week. So taking into account the average number of years spent in the field, uh, that... Uh, the average number of years respondents have been detecting, the result is a huge amount of time spent in the field. Uh, in light of chat's focus this year on the experience of rural areas and the contestation of these places, by which extension I include control or mediation of the archaeological record therein, and the management of access permissions, several data arising from the questionnaire are of interest. When referring to a specific place out of the general detecting landscape, respondents were asked to think about their favourite find spots. One question asked them out of a number of attributes to rank these in order of importance. Rated number one by 59%, <coughs> the most important factor for the majority of detectorists was reported to be the relationship with the landowner, a key factor in gaining permission to access lands, without which one is unable to detect legally. In this light, it becomes clear that the control of access to the rural archaeological record does not lie in the most part with the archaeological profession, but instead with the landowning community. However, in some scenarios, archaeologists are evidently still able to unwittingly influence landowners' decision-making regarding metal detectors getting onto the land. <coughs> Remarks from the research interviews suggested that for many farmers, a key concern was that in the case of having allowed a detectorist onto their lands, they ran the risk that any significant fine might result in an archaeological excavation, which would cause a huge amount of practical and financial disruption. And that was not just a concern for the farming community. In one case, it was a residential developer who was reticent to allow detecting on an empty plot in case something was, that was found that would then impact on his potential profit. Having obtained permission then, the respondents made clear that for the most part, they do develop a sense of attachment to the landscape on which they detect most often, with 70% of respondents either agreeing or strongly agreeing with the statement. The cause of this atta attachment, as explored in my thesis, is far beyond whether or not this environment is simply attractive, as evidenced by the number five ranking in the previous slide, but rather is generated from the experience uh, of a combination of factors too lengthy to go into now, but including aesthetic preference, quality of finds and others, and the interrelation of these within the detectorist's own perceptive milieu. At this stage, however, it's worth mentioning that for 86% of the respondents, the landscape on which they detect most regularly is close to home, a factor which is likely to have considerable effective impact upon their response to the detecting land, and one which has serious ramifications for our consideration today about access to rural landscapes and the archaeological record therein. Most people are, understandably, attached to their home area, whether they metal detect or not. It's the landscape most populated with valuable memories, creating an intimate connection between biography and environment. Many detectorists have been living in and detecting in the same area for decades, so that their detecting practice and interpretation of the finds record has become interwoven with a biographical value and a wealth of built-up local knowledge. For Ralph, it stands to reason that attachment to place will increase over the length of time lived there, 
the implication being that as the resident's attachment becomes more pronounced, their home area of place changes its character for them, both because of improving geographical and social knowledge, and especially because of a growing intensity of involvement and commitment. This is undoubtedly true for the metal detecting community, for whom the involvement and commitment inherent in the activity of detecting in the landscape results in not just an attachment, but also an associated protectiveness over the landscapes on which they detect. A cumulative 81% agreed or strongly agreed that they felt protective, although only 18% reported that they had ever had to actively protect the area from other people. The accompanying detailed text responses in the questionnaire described a range of incidents, but the vast majority referred to the ejection of nighthawks from the land. The conscientious metal detecting community are passionately against such people who they see, rightly, damage the reputation of the hobby, in particular, nighthawks. As one questionnaire respondent wrote, they are a curse to hobby, destructive of our heritage, and only ever have self-interest in the selling value. It's been noted in the 2009 Oxford Archaeology Survey and elsewhere that reputable metal detectorists are an excellent deterrent to nighthawks on the land, and this was supported by the text responses to the questionnaire. And I should say, actually, if you don't know, nighthawks is the informal uh, description given to people who metal detect uh, without permission and illegally, which is usually done under the cover of night. Uh, anyway, land which is regularly detected upon is less likely to be a draw to a criminal element, not only because of the danger of being caught, but also because of the increased likelihood that metal detecting finds will already have been discovered. Metal detectorists regularly visiting certain locales to search provide eyes and ears in the fields for farmers who have far too much land to be able to watch over it all, and will quickly recognise anyone detecting without the permission to be there. The benefit to the landscape of stewardship from conscientious detector users is testified to by statements like the following from a respondent who said, all of my permissions, probably over 600 acres at present, are visited daily or twice daily by myself at all hours of the day and night. I have had to physically remove night hawkers and day hawkers on numerous occasions and now use night vision scope to stop intruders working in total darkness. To unpick the motivations at work behind this level of protectiveness, I'd now like to use some of the data collected from the interviews I conducted between 2012 and 2014. Uh, a brief note on the methodology. In line with the phenomenological underpinning of my research, the interviews I conducted took place out in the landscape, travelling with the interviewee around their detecting lands, in the car and then on foot as well, talking informally and in a non-structured way in order to glean the most authentic and unforced responses. This method, known as go-along interviewing, was important for the study for two principal reasons. Firstly, as Hitching and Jones found elsewhere, walking in place triggered conversations and insights which a sterile interview room might well have neglected. Secondly, and crucially, by placing the interviewee in the role of tour guide, it was possible to avoid the typical power dynamic of academic on one side and research subject on the other, something I was particularly sensitive to given the history of the relationship already mentioned between professional archaeologists and the detecting community. In this way, then, I travelled up to Carlisle, down to Devon and to ten places in between to meet a range of detectorists selected specifically to represent a variety of land types, pasture, arable and foreshore, and who had different approaches to recording finds and interacting with the landscape. 23 hours and 46 minutes of interviews were recorded and transcribed in full and coded into categories using labels that arose naturally out of the conversations themselves. The labels were divided into three themes. Theme A, personal, which included subjects relating to personal attitudes and preferences. Theme B, landscape, which included subjects with direct relevance to landscape experience. And theme C, hobby, which included subjects with specific relevance to meta detecting and the interviewee's approach to the practice of the hobby itself. Six of the 12 interviewees made comments that were coded under the theme B label territoriality or protectiveness, ranking it fifth out of nine subjects in the landscape theme. As suggested by the questionnaire responses which prioritise relationship with the landowner, the detectorist territoriality in some cases seems to reflect the sense that having been given permission by the farmer, they felt a duty to act as a proxy in his stead and challenge people on the land without permission. One said, you get very possessive as well, whether that's stronger because of coming from a farming background and it always having been your land, being possessive of that, I don't know. But I do get, I actually get possessive on behalf of the farmer, so I will challenge inappropriate people who I don't think should be there. For others, the protectiveness arose from their desire to maintain a complete accurate record of the fines coming off the land, 
something that would have been damaged should another detectorist uh, remove objects without them knowing. One interviewee who has devoted a number of years to cataloguing her meta-detecting finds from a Roman site and built her degree dissertation around it stated, I'm very protective over it. I haven't published anything really because I don't want it known about yet until we finish getting as much information as we can about it in case it's Nighthawks and then we'd lose whatever they find because we'd never see it, never know what they come up with. As this statement reflects, the issue is not simply that detectorists don't want others to take the material finds. It's not to do with the loss of something that potentially has material value. Rather, there's a concern for what information might be lost, what piece of the puzzle might not be found if objects were removed from the site without the individual knowing. The interviewee's commitment to preservation by records, to using detected objects in order to complete the puzzle posed by the historic landscape, is supported by the fact that all of them made frequent direct references to theme C labels researching and recording databasing. Indeed, for many of them, the research and documentation element of the quest was almost as enjoyable as the detecting itself. Across the board, they displayed a number of different recording methodologies, all of which provide first-hand evidence of the individuality of their interaction with the archaeology of these rural areas, their approach to searching and finding, in a way that was undoubtedly different to the traditional archaeological approach, nevertheless shares similar elements. It starts with a quest and ends with a discovery, usually with a great deal of hard work in between. One interviewee for whom this is certainly true has been detecting in Leicestershire for over 20 years. In his professional life, he worked for the Environment Agency and often uses GIS software, so it was a natural progression to start using GPS to grid reference his finds and pull the resultant data together to create GIS maps. In this way, he has produ produced many files like the one on the screen now in order to help interpret the data. The map behind me shows a cluster of Roman coins which he suggests shows the original path of the nearby diverted Roman roads. A less high-tech approach is demonstrated by this finds map, just one of many compiled by a couple who have been detecting together since 1978 and are involved in numerous clubs and societies as well as archaeological projects. The diagram behind me is a field that has been searched over so many years the map is now crowned with finds. The system they explained is as followed. Blue with 20th century objects, green at 18th and 19th century, black and medieval, black with a ring around it are Saxon, red are Roman, and red with a ring around it are Iron Age or struck flint. Where there's a concentration of red finds in the top right corner, they've also found a lot of ceramic building material, leading them to conclude there was some sort of Roman settlement there. So even a brief look at the case studies presented here presents a compelling image of a meta-detecting experience that is long-lasting and committed, engaging with the historic landscape and not simply with the material finds. From the questionnaire data, the average length of time the respondents had detected was 10 years. Amongst the interviewees, the person with the shortest length of detecting time had been searching since 2006, whilst on the opposite end of the spectrum, four of the 12 detectorists interviewed had first detected during the 1970s and are still doing it now some 40 years later. This demonstration of the hobby's enduring appeal for its practitioners is symptomatic of an activity that would fall under what Stebbins has, has termed serious ledger namely one that is deeply satisfying, profound, long-lasting, and invariably based on substantial skill, knowledge, or experience, if not on a combination of these three. It's a natural progression, then, for these practitioners to seek to become involved in archaeological projects, and yet the number and range of opportunities available is disappointingly limited. Contrary to the digital sphere, where volunteers have been mobilised as citizen archaeologists by innovative crowdsourced projects such as Micropass and others, there remains a lack of creativity amongst practical projects for detectorist involvement. One explanation may be that, as discussed, the relative freedom from convention and control experienced during legal meta-detecting remains an issue for some archaeologists, suggesting a deep-set opinion that those with professional training <coughs> have the greater claim to the archaeology of rural areas than an amateur population. This is something we must resolve if we accept that cultural heritage is something in which all individuals have a stake. We must now learn to walk what English describes as the tightrope between citizen engagement and the discouragement of activities which are wholly destructive. The conscientious and serious detecting communities in England and Wales are making very real contributions to our understanding of the past via the Portable Antiquity Scheme, with many of them now acting as self-recorders, removing the burden from the fines liaison officers by recording their own fines and those of their club colleagues as well. This year's past conference 
<coughs> entitled Can the Tetris Be Archaeologists? is a signal of how far we've come in incorporating this enthusiastic and willing population into heritage practice, but it still behoves us to come up with innovative offerings going forward. As Ferguson has noted, this does not mean projects where metal detectorists are consigned to the spoil heaps as a nod to community engagement where they can do little damage, but rather finding ways, as in areas such as battlefield surveying, of bringing them alongside archaeologists in order to best develop relationships and encourage dialogue. We should be wary, as Hart and Chilton warn against, of educating the population to see things our way but instead should seek to understand the multiplicity of motivations and attitudes at work behind most of Tetris' continuing commitments, and in particular, their responses to the local historic landscape on which they search, recognising why do Tetris engage in this serious leisure and what needs it fulfils for them. Thanks. Um.